backed up now. Okay. Can't take you nowhere. I'm happy to be with you this morning and through this whole time, just rubbing shoulders with you. Those of you who have been given the most high calling, I don't believe there's anything more important in the world than youth work. So some of my friends who've known me a long time will ask me every now and then what I'm going to do when I grow up. I am approaching 60 years old. I've been in youth work since I was 20. I don't intend to go anywhere else. I want to point you to the first book of Samuel and the 17th chapter, a well-known passage here. I want you to, to look at this old story a new way. Amen. It's a story similar to actually something that happens here in Chicago a lot. <clears throat> we have warring factions in our neighborhood. And they occasionally terrorize our communities. We have factions who believe that they are more than all that. Some of the factions in our neighborhood are called gangs here in Chicago and other places they're just a problem. A lot of the young people I've worked with over the years have been members of gangs. And it, word has gone out periodically that a rumble, a fight, was going to take place somewhere, some locale. And somebody usually ended up being killed. In my neighborhood, when the graffiti goes up, retaliation takes place. Somebody takes down that graffiti. And we can predict within a day that the graffiti goes up who's going to be killed. I mean, which group is going to lose somebody. Right behind me in my home and my family, there are garages. My wife and I are the block captains. So when graffiti goes up, we go out and we paint over it as quickly as it goes up. So quickly sometimes that the guys are not sure that they hit the right garages. We have to be sure that they don't take over. <clears throat> and so on our block, we, th th our neighbors have organized and we are somewhat in control. As opposed to a couple blocks on both sides of me where the gangs really have taken over. In this chapter, young David goes out early in the morning. He left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed, Jesse his father. He reached the camp as of the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the bad dude on the block, the bully, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. I'm not going to go any further. I 
I do wonder, though, <clears throat> what you see in the area where you're ministering, what you see in your neighborhood, what you see in your community, what do you see? If you follow here, David saw something that others didn't seem to see. So, so sometimes some activity will happen in the neighborhood and you ask three or four people what happened. What, what did you see? And, and the stories are different because people don't, didn't see the same thing. It's important that you see clearly, that you have good vision, that you can see what no one else can see. When you're doing youth work, and I contend that to, in order to, to see correctly, you know, it's like seeing, like Jesus saw when he, when he looked over Jerusalem. It's, it's Paul looking over and seeing his people and saying, I, I wish that I could go to hell, that they would be saved. What do you see? I mean, some people see kids as just a nuisance, just a pain. Some, some people see young people as, as trouble, as a problem. When David got to the battlefield, he saw this giant. But more, he saw someone who had the nerve, the gall, not to challenge the people of Israel, but to challenge the Lord God Almighty himself. It was, no, make no mistake about it, a challenge to God. It's a spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. Not everybody sees that. The forces that are lining up in our neighborhoods and our communities are the forces of evil. Challenging the Lord God of hosts. Now to see all this there's just three things you need to do to see well, to gain 20-20 vision. You need to stop. Sometimes stopping is, is hard when you're engaged in ministry. But I want to first challenge you about stopping. And remember this. God is more concerned about who you are than what you do. Because if you are the right person, you will do the right things. But just because you do right things don't make you the right person. And we have a lot of people doing a lot of right things, but they're not right. And if you're going to be in youth ministry and do something for, for God, you need to stop and ensure that you're working on becoming the right person. It is important about your character. It is important about who you are. Just because you can run the best dog and pony show in town does not make you who God wants you to be. Just because you can fill the gymnasium does not make you who God wants you to be. And we have no evidence that he is smiling on you. So I want to challenge you this morning. Stop. Take stock of yourself. Are you who God wants you to be? Are you working in that direction? Is that your goal? My life goal to be conformed to the image of Christ. I am working on it. That's what I find more significant than anything else in my life. It's pursuing that goal. 
to be who God wants me to be, conform to the image of Christ. That's why we hear about someone who's fallen into great sin, who has gone off the deep end, somebody who's given up, all because they were pursuing stuff, doing things, becoming a activity freak. While all along, they were not right. In the end, it's going to matter only how well you pursued this goal, to be conformed to the image of Christ. You need to stop and also make some time for yourself. If you're doing youth ministry, some people are too busy to take away a few moments for themselves. And you know, you need to be refreshed every now and then. Replenished, refueled. You need to gear up. You can't give, give, give without backing off every now and then. Getting yourself together. And we become known as workaholics, those in youth work. We, we're, we're known by that. And we, we, we wear that proudly. But in, when you're running on empty, you can't do very much for anybody else. When you're on empty, you are empty. Now, you know, I'm really afraid of that guy because I'm wondering about what he's give, dishing out. You know, where's that coming from? You see, if you don't have time to stop for prayer, you don't have time for a retreat, you don't have time to get away and refuel, then... I think you're manufacturing stuff. Now we really get the word. You need to stop. You're going too fast. Stop. I wish I knew then what I know now. I, I thought it was about a lot of the Activities. I could, I, could, I could fill that gymnasium every time. There was no problem for me. I had big youth groups. I could do all of that. But I, I learned that if I was going to be able to give something, I had to be strong myself and allow God to infuse his power in me. I had to stop. Then you need to stop because there's something called confession. And it's a powerful thought, confession. I have found that it clears the air. Confession. When I tell God what he already knows about my life, when I agree with him, it clears the air. I feel good all over. Confession is something we should do not once a week or once a month or now and then, but daily. We need to confess that we ain't all that. We, we need to confess that we've messed up and that we are a mess. It's okay because that's, how, that's the kind of people God seems to use. People who are a mess. That's right. You, you just read the Bible here and all you find is God deciding to use people who are a mess. He don't use anybody else. Every day you need to stop and confess. Humbly let God know that you know that it ain't about you. It's about him. 
that your pride has sometimes taken over. You need to let him know that you know. So you need to stop. And while you're stopping, I have found that to, to let teenagers hang out with me is one of the most powerful statements you can make to a young person. You can make. You see, letting a young person hang out with you in a time when young people are wrestling with self-esteem and, and who they are speaks volumes of how important you think they are that you allow them to hang out with you. I, I, I don't know if your home is open to, to teens. It should be. It should be. I mean, the more they hang around you, the more important they think you think they are. Because where they're from, nobody is giving them those signals. Somebody is, is trying to get rid of them. Somebody is trying to, to, root, to remove them. Somebody is trying to diss them. You see what I'm saying? You can make a difference in a lot of young people's lives by allowing them to hang out with you. When I met Joe White years ago from Young Life, Joe was, um, had, had two fellas with him everywhere he went. And I say one day, Joe, who, who are those two guys? These were two high school age fellas but they followed him around everywhere. They followed him around when he did fundraisers. They followed him around when he was visiting somebody, when he did the ministry, when he traveled to speak. He took these two fellows with him. He said, that's my discipleship program. But those two fellows felt like they were really special that this man had allowed them to hang out with them. Do you do that? Do you have some kids you let hang out? See, my house is Grand Central Station. Everybody lives at my house. Everybody's at my house from some time or another for a lot of reasons. We run a homework club, hospitality house. We have a recreational park. We have an emergency assistance program. And so in my house, it's, it's all day. The bell is ringing all day long, and somebody is at my door, and kids are all up in my house all day. Because we've said it's okay. When the shooting starts in my neighborhood, my house is a safe place. There's a place for them they know they can be. Sometimes when a mama can't get along with son, she said, well, can, you, can he stay the night with you? You know, so we have a lot of things like that. But there's a message that goes out that says you are important. You are important. When they know you want them around. So my encouragement to you is to, to allow this. Stop and let kids hang out with you. Now, stop is fine, but... Um, in order to, to see what's going on and understand it in our world, understand some of the giants that are threatening to take over our communities. To understand and fight these giants, you not only have to stop, but you have to look. Now everybody sees everything I told you the same, but you really have to look. What do you see when you see young people? What do you, what do you see? When you, when you see a young person, do you see potential? Do you see potential? Do you see him as he is or as he could be? Do you see him as incomplete like you? You know, on the way? How do you see a young person? I mean, we are in a society that, that groups them all as the same. 
They say young people. And in, in that sense, nobody gets to be an individual. It's just young people. They do this. Young people do that. And after a while, I guess anybody would get tired of that, those kind of designations. You know, I'm me. I'm not like everybody else. In my house, with my kids, I have to distinguish that, from the, that they are different. You know, I have to distinguish between them. And they, they will let me know. You know, Dad, I, I, I'm, I'm not so-and-so. Because they want to be seen. They want you to look at them. And much of society doesn't look at these kids seriously. Look at them. And we look at these externals, which I heard about before. We look at how they dress. We look at the hair. We look at some of those kinds of things, and we miss the person. We really don't see. Who's going to interpret young people to adults if not the youth worker? But you got to see. And all this is so inter interconnected, you see. And if you ain't hanging out with them, how are you going to see? You see, you got to see beyond the external. You got to see who they really are down inside. We, we have gang members throughout our neighborhood and what we have discovered working with these fellas sometimes is in a group, they have one profile. But as an individual, there's a whole other thing going on. And if you don't ever approach the, the person individually, you know, you, you really have missed him. You really missed him. Parents don't even know their own kids. I, I was told to go to Cook County Jail where a young man had been picked up with four other fellas for shooting a store owner. And the mother who I've known very well said that uh, pick up Jock, go see Jock, he's in jail. And you know, he's, uh, he was in the wrong place, the wrong group. He, he, you know, he, he really didn't do anything. So I went to see him. And what I found out was Jock is the leader of the group. Jock is in charge, and everything that went on went on because of Jock. Mothers don't even know their own kids. But you need to see. Look. Look real well. Look at the city that you're in. And understand more than the statistics. Look at the city. What's, what's going on? Do you understand a spiritual warfare is happening? Look. Because that look caused Jesus to weep. Looking at a city. Did you ever looked at your city? Do you see lost souls? Do you see young people as lost? Does it ever bring you to tears? Have you ever cried? I think youth workers cry a lot. I think we cry because we see. You see the terrible cycles duplicated over and over and over. And the enemy seems to have a tight grip. And you see this. We put, brought a young man into our house when he was nine years old on just weekends. And um, we tried to get him to be at our house more permanently. He came from a drug house in the neighborhood. His mother had 11 children. She was on welfare. And 
there were about six fathers. We felt that the only way that Jose would be saved would be to expose him to something else than what he was used to looking at. All he knew was all he knew. So we said, okay. We asked his mother, could he come to be at our house? And she said, just on the weekends. So he stayed until he was 16. He left our house around 16 because he was real anxious to become one of the gang members. The pressure was too high. And his brothers were all in and out of prison. But the brother who was just two years older than him, the only one who had ever made it through high school, was about to graduate, was killed when somebody shot him point blank in the head, days before graduation. I, I look at a lot of kids. I see a lot of funerals. A lot of young people dying before their time. And I, I find myself crying. I cry because I don't know. I don't have. I'm not the answer. And it really gets to me. Do you see your city like that? Does it move you to tears? Is this just an experiment? Is this just a kick you on? Something you'll do to something better comes along? I mean, is, is this the idea that, you know, I'll get into youth work for a little while and, and maybe after two or three years, I'll, I'll get on with my life. I'll go and do what I really want to do. Is that how it comes? then it might not affect you. You might not be moved. You, you might not weep. But it causes me to weep. I think it causes God's heart to weep. We need to look at the city. We need to look at the individuals. And finally, we need to listen. If you're going to be effective, you're going to see right and see what others don't see and get into the midst of a spiritual warfare. You need to listen. When, when you have young people around, you hang out with young people, you get to hear all kind of stuff. And I, I, I do. I, they're in my house all day, so I hear everything going on. And... Uh, Sometimes it's, oops, sorry, you know, and, but I hear everything. And it's that listening that helps me understand who some of them really are. It's listening that causes me to go to their house sometimes to see what kind of house he comes from. Because only then can I understand who he is. If you're a youth worker and you never go to the house, you're missing it. And I be, I'm listening constantly and he's telling me about home. Now sometimes, you know, when you listen, you know, you, you can't believe everything you hear. I mean, mom and dad are demons. You know, and, and, and you listen to that long time and you begin to, to, to take it on you know poor this poor kid and you know and you, you can see his folks with horns and everything you know and they're really bad but then you go and you visit them and home may or may not be all that he said it was 
but you need to go and see. I mean, five minutes in his house will tell you why he's the way he is. You, you need to go to the house because youth work today demands that you have a contact with the house, with the home. That's the nature of youth work. I mean, you used to could do youth work in, the, in your little building there and, and you, you, you didn't have to. But you now you must go there. Encounter the people he lived with. You need to listen to him. As you listen to him, don't, don't take everything personal. Young people have a way of expressing themselves that are not intended to be personal, but sometimes forthright, in your face. And, and we have a way of taking it personal. It's not always personal. It's important what he's saying. Listen to the message. Listen to the message. In fact, you've got to be able to read between the lines. What's he, what's he saying that's not being expressed in the words? What's he saying? What's he, what's he really trying to tell me? And when you listen, you have to listen in such a way as not to be shocked by a lot else you'd never be told anything else <laughs> so you, you, you have to appear like you know oh yeah that, is that right hmm. <laughs> some shocking stuff now but you gotta act like you ain't shocked you know you gotta listen you gotta be illicit and let me tell you about never getting yourself in a position where you guarantee a young person confidentiality. You, you should never get in that position. Don't promise it. Because you don't know what he's about to tell you. There are some things, you know, that have legal ramifications and moral ramifications and then you are not to put yourself into that position. But you need to listen well. What is he really trying to say? At his house, nobody might be listening. Of course, his opinion is an important one. What he has to say isn't important. So he, he really does need somebody he can go to. And he can open up. When you listen, listen. Don't, don't always feel like you got to solve something. Sometimes listening is good all by itself. Sometimes it's all you can do. Just listen. Don't, don't become the, you know, the answer man. You, you can't fix everything. There's no demand that you do. That you know everything. But you can be a good listener. Listen. What you're hearing is somebody who decided to trust you. Somebody's decided to trust you and to tell you what's going on in his life. We learn a lot in the kitchen of our house and more than we want to know, <laughs> quite frankly. I mean, it, it, it's just there. You don't have to ask for it, it's just there. So, I, so what you do is with that information and what I'm learning, it helps me know how to minister to him. It, it, it helps me know where he's coming from, where he's itching. And it's an interesting thing in my house because part of our, our understanding is the kids we bring in is to try to demonstrate another way and so they will talk about what they see in my house and it then becomes a reflection on what's not in their house. So, for example, if we have a couple of them over for dinner, this is maybe the first time some of them have sat around a table together and had a meal. Maybe the first time. And so they will say that. They will tell me how, how things are in their house. 
Everybody kind of catches something on his own. On, everybody's on the run. There's no time for anything. There's no, there's no structure to anything in the house. And the only structure he has is when he comes to what we're doing. And learning to say thanks and may I have this or that. Part of the ongoing teaching that we will always do that's informal. We are constantly teaching. A lot of it is informal. It's not all formal teaching. But when you see in your neighborhood, and I've just talked about gangs in my neighborhood. That's one of the giants of my neighborhood we're wrestling with. They, we have some different giants, perhaps. They're giants of all kinds, and these are threatening to us all. Threatening our kids. Drugs, another one. Threatening our kids. Our best and brightest being lost. You know, just a shame. We've, we've got to come to church. The Christian community has got to come up with answers to how kids can make money. Do you hear me now? How kids can make money without selling drugs. This is the nature of youth work. I'm putting it right on your shoulders. I'm saying that we have got to come up with ways to help young people make money without selling drugs. The Christian community. We cannot continue to give soft answers. We've got to get involved in this problem of work and employment. We've got to get right in the middle of it because this is the nature of youth work. You, you could do youth work before and never have to worry about you solving some kid's employment problem. Today's youth work requires this. You've got to get involved. I don't know how you're doing youth work now. I'm just telling you, that's the nature. If you're not doing that, it's no wonder we're not touching a lot of the lives out on the street. We've got to get involved. So, you listen and you hear what the problems are in the hood. We got kids who cannot make it past the seventh grade because they can't read. And a week in high school, in junior high school, is embarrassing enough that we lose a lot of them because they can't read. They don't know functional math. You know, this is the nature of youth work. I'm telling you, you've got to listen and then get involved in this. We cannot analyze the problems of our neighborhood and give soft answers. We've got to come up with solutions. How do you help kids read and do functional math? How do you... How does the church do that? There are models. There are folks who do those things. And if you're not, if you're calling youth work, the meeting that you have on Friday night where the kids you already got, the sons and daughters of the deacons and the preacher, gather and have a nice meeting and we sing together and we rock together. And uh, if, if this is youth work, I'm sorry, we're missing it. Listen, and you'll hear the problems. And it will be God's direction for where we should go. You see, rarely does God give you information for you to file away in the file cabinet. It's usually so you can do something about the situation. This is what David came and saw. He got involved. He listened, and he said, you know what? Who is this guy? Who is he? That he should defy the armies of the Lord. When well, in essence, God Almighty. Yeah, I'll, I'll fight him. I'll fight him. Because he had information. And the other piece of information he had was that God is awesome. And this giant was no match.
Do you listen? Do you have the right information? Do you get involved? So my challenge to you, stop, look, listen. Time's running out. 